Here I will be discussing molecularity of elimination reactions and I have two recommendations for you before you proceed. First, you must have already watched the introduction to S end and E reactions. And then second, you must have watched at least the first part of my discussion on the molecularity of S end reactions. Because as you will see later, there are a lot of parallels between S end and E reactions. Such that in my explanations later, I will just always compare it to the S end reactions we have encountered before. So first, just like SN, wherein you have SN1 and SN2, we also have the so-called E1 and E2 reactions. Now, in E1, the 1, just like 1 in SN1, the number 1 here means unimolecular. And in E2, just like in SN2, the 2 here means bimolecular. Now, that means that in E1, there's only one molecule involved in the rate determining step, and that is our substituted alkane, which is this one. But for E2, not only is the substituted alkane involved, but also our base. So first, in E1, the first thing that would happen is that from the alpha carbon, we can see the leaving group getting electrons from the bond right here, and the leaving group leaves. Leaving alpha carbon one electron lacking and therefore giving us a carbocation. And this step is actually the rate determining step, just like in SN1, wherein the first step was also the rate determining step. And in the second step, the base B will give electrons to this H, allowing this H to go away and giving this electrons to the bond between the alpha carbon and our beta carbon then giving us an additional pi bond or double bond as a final product. And we already know that supposedly the final product of elimination reactions are alkenes. For bimolecular reactions, it's one entire step wherein the base will directly go to this hydrogen right here. And then when the base abstracts the hydrogen here, this bond will go in between the alpha and the beta carbons and that will force our leaving group to leave. All of that, all of these happening in one entire step. So of course, the beta hydrogen goes away with the base, the leaving group goes away, we get our pi bond, we're done. And just like SN1, SN2, SN1 has two steps, E1 also has two steps. Just like SN2, which has one step, E2 has one step. So you see a lot of parallels there because anyway, the molecularity by, by definition was not, was not different from before. But what's different here is the fact that unlike SN, there is a special type of elimination reaction or mechanism called E1CB. For E1CB, we can imagine a base once again going to a beta hydrogen and abstracting it. But this time, instead of this bond going in between the alpha and the beta, if you can imagine we have another carbon next to the beta, which we can call the gamma, the electrons can go here and the gamma, considering that it has a pi bond, will uh, move this to an R further away. Following the arrows, this one will become a double bond and then this one will become a negative charge on the R. And then in the next step, the negative charge on the R will jump back here, becoming this, and then this double bond will move here, becoming this. And then the leaving group takes electrons away from the alpha carbon, and then the leaving group leaves. And this is our final product. And it's also an alkene. But what's so special is that not only did you make an alkene as a final product, you often make a conjugated diene from this reaction. Now, Recall that in general chemistry, we have this basic formula for the dissociation of an acid, wherein an acid HA can dissociate into the proton H plus and A minus, which we call as the conjugate base. And can we call this conjugate base also? Well, what happened really was that an H was taken away, right? Just like here, initially A had an H, and then later A lost an H, and then had a negative charge. Oh, you see a negative charge here also, right? So therefore, this is actually what we call the conjugate base in the reaction, and this now gives justice to the mechanism being called E1CB. 
And E1CB is different from E1 in several aspects. Like, for example, in E1, the first thing to go was the leaving group. In E1CB, the first one to go is a beta hydrogen. In E1, the intermediate was a carbocation. But in E1CB, of course, CB means I need to have a negative charge. So, most likely, a carbonium. So, although they are both E1 in the sense that they have two steps, right? Two steps for E1 and two steps for E1. CB. It's kind of reverse if you think about it in terms of the sequence. Now, the good thing about our products is that alkenes are planar, right? And uh, thank goodness we don't need to discuss things like inversion or racemization or retention because there's no chirality if my product has sp2 atoms. So, nice. So, um, the only thing we need to discuss now is how to determine if the reaction you're seeing is an E1 or E2, assuming that you already know it's an elimination reaction in the first place. It's also easier. First of all, usually when we use any base that's qualified for elimination reactions, it's always E2. Assuming that you're going to perform the reaction using high concentrations or excess amounts of E2. Although... It still depends on the substrate because if your substrate has a particular type of alpha carbon, it might differ. For example, if the alpha carbon of my substrate is E1, then I am sure I am guaranteeing myself that um, the tertiary alpha carbon will perform an E1 type of elimination. If it's a primary alpha carbon, I am more or less guaranteed that the elimination is going to be E2. If it's a secondary alpha carbon, just like in SN, it's kind of blurry and you need to look at other factors to, to, to see if it's E1 or E2. Although, for simplicity of the discussion, we will not anymore dwell further on that. Now, finally, for E1CB, notice this. Let's go back to E1CB. Isn't it that I told you for E1CB, the base will abstract a hydrogen and this bond will go here and... Uh, Therefore, from the gamma carbon, this double bond can move here, assuming that we have a double bond. So therefore, the only requirement in E1CB is that for my gamma carbon, I must have something that can delocalize, in other words, a pi bond. So that's what it says here. The gamma carbon, which is next to the beta carbon, must have a stabilizing force, usually delocalization. Because if there is no double bond here, then this arrow is impossible. And there, th therefore, this is also not possible. Long story short, it's not possible to have E1CB without it. So, that's the only requirement. So, if I have a gamma carbon with a pi bond, then E1CB is probable. If not, then you're gonna now just have to choose between E1 and E2.